Welcome back to News Talk, 17 before the hour now. Joining us now, Politico reporter Kevin Robillard. Welcome back. Good to have you here. Great to be on. Uh, two big things that we want to talk with you about. One, the uh, Democratic debate from over the weekend, Hillary Clinton, mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders, former Maryland Governor Martin O'Malley on mm -hmm. the debate stage. Uh, we also want to talk about the data breach and the back and forth that has ensued between the Sanders camp and the DNC mm -hmm. with, uh, I guess, staffers for the Sanders campaign uh, at least a couple of them now former staffers as yeah. a result of a situation that's very still very fluid still yeah. very much in flux but let's talk about the debate first mm -hmm. what uh, and we'll talk about the timing of it which mm -hmm. was odd yes. but, but in terms of the substance what was the big takeaway for you so the bi the big substance for me is how clearly it seems that Hillary is ready to move on from debating <laughs> these two guys um, she you know Martin O'Malley is still you know, well in third place. I wouldn't be surprised actually if you saw like a small surge for Martin O'Malley, maybe towards the end, so he ends up getting, you know, 10% of the vote in New Hampshire, which isn't really where he's at right now. But both Martin O'Malley and Bernie Sanders, she's well ahead of both of them. And during the debate, she really seemed to focus more of her fire almost on the Republicans uh, and arguing against, you know, Republicans who weren't really there to defend themselves, arguing particularly against Donald Trump in some cases. Smart policy, a, a smart approach for mm -hmm. her. Is this a smart Yeah, I, I think it is. I mean, at this point, you know, she's getting hit at every GOP debate by every single one of those candidates. And it's just the assumption is that she's the Democratic nominee in a way that it wasn't in 2008 uh, when people at this point, Hillary was still ahead in the polls, but I think people were still giving both Barack Obama and John Edwards more of a chance than people are giving Bernie Sanders right now for a number of reasons. So the fact is, because she's already taking this much fire, she needs to be able to fire back. And the fact is that neither Sanders nor O'Malley is hitting her. So why would she spend time sort of punching downward, so to speak? Did the attacks in Paris and San Bernardino undercut some of the Sanders campaign appeal? I mean, he's got a core following. Yeah. A lot of people, including those who would say mm -hmm. they're supporting the other two, love uh, you know, of the mm -hmm. uh, on the yeah. left. A lot of people on the left love what he's saying. Mm -hmm. They love the fact that he's talking about mm -hmm. issues that other people don't spend that much time or attention mm -hmm. on. But when the world is concerned about core safety, to some of the other issues of income inequality mm -hmm. and the shrinking middle class, the way the system seems rigged against the average uh, mm -hmm. family, uh, are those are those tougher issues to maintain traction than maybe prior to Paris? Yeah, they definitely are. And to be clear, the Democratic primary electorate, if you actually look at what they're most concerned about, uh, you know, Pew recently did a poll, Pew often polls on what issues are most important to people. The economy is still number one. Uh, among sort of the general election electorate, it's tied between the economy and national security, roughly. And among Republicans, national security has a very significant lead. So it, when you look at all of that, you know, it definitely does undermine Sanders' campaign, particularly because there are times where Sanders just sort of refuses to talk about national security. Bernie Sanders has been out there giving this same speech about economic inequality and how corporations are too powerful for 25 or 30 years, and he's not going to stop giving it. You know, that's been his message, and that's why he has the appeal he has, but he's not able to adjust to the moment because, you know, A, it's not particularly clear that Bernie Sanders spends a lot of time thinking about these issues to begin with, and it's not you know, it's not why he's out there. There's, you know, always been the question of sort of, was Bernie Sanders really running for president to win the presidency? Mm. Or is Bernie Sanders running for president to drag Hillary Clinton to the left? I think if his goal was the second, he's definitely done some work there, maybe not nearly as far as he would like. But yes, clearly the Paris and San Bernardino attacks have hurt Sanders' appeal and just limited it more than anything else. A discussion of Second Amendment issues was sort of an emotional high point of the debate. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's been something that they've clashed on repeatedly because it's one area where there's sort of larger gaps between the candidates. Uh, you know, Bernie Sanders, coming from Vermont, has always had to support gun rights in a way that um, your traditional Democrat doesn't because hunting is such a large part of the culture there. You know, and that's led to him making some sort of absurd explanations. For example, he voted to allow guns on Amtrak, and he said that was so that hunters could get to hunting, you know, places where they would go hunt. You don't really take Amtrak, which is mostly in the heavily urbanized parts of the country, to go hunt. That's just not something that really makes a lot of sense. And then you'll see Clinton has sort of had more of a moderate ground, um, although her husband obviously was responsible for the assault weapons ban. And this is an area where O'Malley in particular has been very, very much, you know, in favor of gun control mm -hmm. and has really tried to make that sort of a defining issue for him at times uh, with sort of limited success. Uh, the Republican debates, for the most part, have been these 
prime time mm -hmm. extravaganzas that have drawn huge audiences and been much discussed, not just by uh, the usual crowd, people like yeah. you and me and folks who would watch a show like this one where you're really into mm -hmm. policy and public affairs, but across the population broadly. This, this debate was striking because it was Saturday night on the weekend, the last weekend before Christmas when uh, anyone who mm -hmm. was able to snag a, a, a holiday party invitation yes. or was hosting an event w w was otherwise engaged. Mm -hmm. uh, this is on purpose, right? This is a this is a cynical, or you could, one could say, attempt to hide the debate. So, to the extent that there is dirty mm -hmm. laundry aired or clashing mm -hmm. within the party, that it's not damaging the not the eventual nominees' prospects when they get to the yeah. general. And also, it was going up against the biggest movie opening in years. It was another thing, and I'm sure quite a few people were out seeing Star Wars as opposed to watching this debate. So there were a lot of things keeping this debate, you know, under wraps, so to speak. And this was a strategy by Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Um, and, it, you know, she would deny it and say that, you know, other people at the DNC agreed to this schedule. There's been lots of dissent from people within the DNC about the debate schedule, mm -hmm. um, although that sort of died down a little bit just because I think it became clear that Wasserman Schultz wasn't going to change it. And this was her strategy. She didn't want to give these other candidates a chance to have big breakout moments that would possibly hurt the chances of Hillary winning the nomination. And I think there's a decent case to be made that she's ending up hurting Hillary with that strategy because Hillary, mm -hmm. throughout the 2008 campaign, going back to her 2000 campaign for Senate, has always done best in debates. Hillary works best when she has someone, an enemy, a rival of some type to play off of, which is why, you, you know, even at congressional hearings, Hillary's always thought to have done pretty well because she's able to sort of play off the person she's arguing with. Interesting. So to the extent that the case can be made that she's doing well now, mm -hmm. the, the bounce from that is muted because the audiences are clearly smaller. Yeah. Let's get to the uh, issue with... Uh, a member of the Sanders campaign seeing things in a DNC database they shouldn't have seen and the fallout from all of that. Yeah, this is really an in-the-weeds campaign uh, issue. Basically, uh, the Sanders campaign accessed Hillary Clinton's voter files from what's called NGP Van, which is the dominant, really pretty much the only Democratic firm that offers sort of voter databases. So that means in that database, if you're the Clinton campaign, you have scores for voters, for example, how likely they are to vote for you what sort of issues that they might care about, what appeals you can make to them. And this is really getting granular data mm -hmm. on each one of these people based on you know, volunteers talking to them. This data takes a long time to assemble. And ultimately, sort of as the agreement, the agreement that NGP Van, the DNC and campaigns have, is that you know, NGP Van's a private company. Basically, at the end of any campaign, all of this data goes to the DNC and everybody sort of gets to look at it. I see. So it's a big shared thing so that ultimately Democrats everywhere benefit from it. Gotcha. But when a primary is along, NGP Van is in charge of sort of keeping these firewalls separate. Um, and basically the Sanders campaign argument is they realized that these firewalls were leaky and they did this to make a point. Um, to, you know, to show that NGP Van needs to improve its security. So that's really a you know, how much people want to believe that mm -hmm. is, you know, sure. something I guess voters will have to decide. But it's it's a very in the weeds thing. I'm not sure it's going to end up having a huge impact on the campaign, but uh, it is interesting. Has part of the fallout though from all this beyond the obvious mm -hmm. issue where it's been embarrassing for Sanders and I guess some staffers have been mm -hmm. disciplined in some way. Uh, does it reinforce a, a pre existing narrative that the DNC was Rather than, you know, they should be mm. neutral because we're in the primary, but the, re the, the, the bottom line reality is the, they want it to be Clinton, they think it's Clinton, and they're part of the Clinton campaign. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's very clear. And it does reinforce that narrative to a certain extent. You know, you can argue, you know, I think you can see a lot of campaign strategists, you know, on Twitter and stuff are arguing about, you know, which is worse, being cut out of this database for 48 hours, which makes it very hard to target voters and to, you know, figure out who to call to round up volunteers for an event, stuff like that or, you know, stealing the other campaign's data. The Clinton campaign is claiming that this is as bad as if someone walked into their, you know, campaign mm -hmm. coffers and stole five to ten million dollars. It's difficult to know for sort of anyone else to know because we don't have access to this data, what exactly was taken and how exactly valuable it is, but it's clearly something that is severe. Whether or not it shows the DNC's bias, is unclear. I would say one thing that showed the DNC's bias more was sort of Debbie Washerman Schultz's response where she, you know, said the Sanders' campaign was full of bluster and was, she was almost attacking the Sanders' campaign, which isn't something she should be doing. We only have 30 seconds left. Is it assumed that 
uh, the three candidates who were on the stage the other night will be alive and kicking when we get to Iowa and New Hampshire, and that, there will, that this is not going to be a true coronation. There will be some amount of balloting before. Yeah, I would definitely say so. Uh, Sanders is almost certainly going to make it probably farther than that. I imagine O'Malley, he's stuck in it less, this long. He's in for Iowa and New Hampshire, at least. Kevin Robillard, uh, reporter for Politico. Always great having you here. Thanks very much for your time. Have a great holiday. Great to be on. We will talk with you again soon. We'll step aside. We are back, though, with a News Talk program note. Keep it here.